I will. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So okay, you can hear. You all can hear me. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah. We I can hear you. Hear you, Doug. And we are ready to start. Forgive us slowness, but I mean, with every degree centigrade up, we are getting slower and slower. Yeah. Yeah. It's a little bit like a greenhouse in here. So if we behave strangely, Doc, that's what's happening. Oh, okay. So I'll say I'll send you cool thoughts. Yeah, please start. Yep. Okay. So if you're if you guys are ready, I'm ready. So I'll start whenever you give me the go. Okay. Guys, yeah. We're starting. Let's start. Let's start. Hey, 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 guys. We're gonna we're gonna wait up. Hi, folks. Yeah, that's gonna. Okay, I'm. I have the authorization to go. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Here I go. Hey, welcome everybody. Hey, thanks. Thanks for in uh, allowing me to speak here about Mike's and I work, and I'll and I'll and I'll keep to the time limit because I know you're saying that that space has to be empty in an hour. So, um, so you know, this is a retrospective summary of what we did, including the geometric algebra. Some of these stuff you've seen two years ago when I presented, and so I'll go through those quickly, but it's a good summary talk. So I'll focus. So so Mike and I didn't always agree on things. Um, and, you know, I was interested in more in the quantum mind perspective. So I was interested in quantum computing since my PhD was in quantum computing, and Mike helped me with that. So I'm, but I, but the commonality is this geometric algebra approach that he that he introduced to me, which includes the bit the coin demo. So so and and then this topsy talk was a separate talk. So so here's when I first met Mike was in the conference ninety two and ninety four conferences. Um, by the way, there's a link to a secret page that has all the. I don't post that anywhere, but here you can you can go to those links and. Um, just because supposedly it's copyrighted by the computer society, but one day they opened all their stuff up. And so I just downloaded all the repositories and, and stored them on my, on my site so people could get at them. Um, so Mike started working with me after this for PhD in 97. I went and visited him in Crestone when he was first building, essentially camping out in his place while he was building it and for a week. And, um, and this is when the GALG tool emerged because we were trying to do these computations by hand and we couldn't do it. We kept making sign errors and then the whole result would be void. So by 2001, I defended my PhD topic and Mike was there for that. And then I graduated um, and the first program was in Perl for this GALG tool. And then I attended the conference in the fall and presented that work. And all of these things are on my website, quantumdug.com. Um, so you can go there and see the AMPA section and you can see all this stuff there. So finally, I built a new version of the um, Python version of the interaction tool instead of Perl so that it was more interactive. It's only about 2,000 lines of code. It's not big. And I think I had Mike was my only one, one customer worldwide that was using my tool, you know, really popular tool. Um, <laughs> so, but then in 2012, Mike says, Mike, Doug, help me with this. I think I have a standard model. So he, Mike was interested in Topsy, but he was also interested in quantum computing. But since since that's why he worked with me for my PhD was that, and and we showed for my PhD that you can show that you can build a qubit and an e-bit using just pure bit vectors from geometric algebra, and you can bootstrap physics that way. So at least qubits. And so then we, he started. He says, "Well, here here's the standard model," and he he thinks this was the Higgs boson. So we did this paper, um, and I gave a talk about that on pervasive entanglement in 2013, because it turns out when Mike was wanting me to do that, I'd hurt my back. So I was on painkillers during that time and I was helping him with, with coding and, and models and testing. And, but what we realized is that his model for the standard model seemed to hold, hold water. And it says you can bootstrap not only qubits and ebits, but you can also bootstrap the entire standard model using the Higgs boson. And that was that talk that I gave the pervasive entanglement talk. And so you can get, you can find that on my website too. And so finally, of all of this, I, I released and, and Mike didn't understand when he says, he, this is the Higgs boson. He says, I says, well, Mike, that's entangled. See, he's, he wasn't used to looking at geometric algebra the way I was. And I knew what entangled states look like, um, the Bell states essentially. So, so that was the, 
the real aha phenomena when we started working on that part. And so finally, I put all this in my book in, um, in 2019. I released it. I started working on 2014. And my co-author was Bill Tiller, um, who is now who's now deceased, but he's famous um, for working in metaphysics area. And uh, he, I'm the only person that he's ever co-wrote a book with. Um, he's written a lot of other books, but he had an assistant. But this is it. And so then I gave these talks, and then Mike passed away. So, so that's so. Here's the big picture. You know, everybody's looking at physics, and again, some of these slides were in some of my other talks. So. I'm going to kind of go through this quickly because I have uh, too many slides for the time. Um, but realize that there's this point here below the, you know, you go down to the Planck scale and then you go down to where there is no space and there is no time. This is the area that Mike and I were working. We didn't believe that the, the geometric algebra system itself was in space time, which is completely opposite of what the standard model stuff is and even quantum computing, they all put everything assuming it's in space time. And so we're trying to do sort of more fundamental. It's a hyperspace with an infinite number of orthogonal dimensions. And this picture down here is trying to represent what that means. But remember, every pair that you pick is orthogonal to all other pairs. And you can't compress that and put it in a three-dimensional space. It's a superspace, hyperspace, that has all these orthogonal dimensions. And then if you take two of those combined, you get more dimensions, which is the orthogonal ve Vic vector. And then you combine those qubits. In the, and so this whole, was all happening in what I call protophysics. And there it comes from bootstrapping bits, qubits, and e-bits. And this is all pre-space and pre-time. OK, so, so this is a complete. We are losing you. Oh, there you completely fundamentally different than anything else in physics it's doing and this is really mike's work so huh say that again uh, we lost can you all hear me okay so it. my internet okay. keeps dropping out a little bit yeah so hopefully hopefully you can see it okay so um you can see me now yes yes yeah. okay great i'll 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 just check with you every so often to make sure that everybody's online so so this is a kind of way to think about this. If you have A and B as vec bit vectors, Mike would call those um, to you know tokens, or he would call them places in his in his in his computer model in his in his block world model spaces for that. But I don't look at I I wasn't interested in Mike's top top. Um, I mean I knew since early two thousands he had Topsy, um, but I didn't. Didn't, wasn't interested in that. I was interested in these more primitive notions of uh, bit vectors, okay? And so you can think of each A and B as a bit vector orthogonal to everything else. And if they're, this is the coin demo here, we're gonna talk about it. If you have A plus B, that means it's concurrent. This is, a, this is what he calls co-occurrence. Co it's that these two things happen at the same time. Well, this is not a relativistic co-occurrence. This is an exact. And physics doesn't really have anything like that in the you know, you can't have simultaneity anywhere in physics. There is no simultaneity in relativity, but this has to be truly simultaneous. Otherwise you really don't have it. So we would call this a space like plus operator. And then if you have co-exclusion, it says, I saw this state and later I saw this state. Well, that means these states here are the inverse of each other. That means some algorithm, some operator fired this and turned it into this. These can't occur simultaneously. They're mutual, they're, they're, they, they disallow each other. If you add these two sides up, you get zero, okay? And so, so if you add those two sides up, it means it cannot occur. So Mike had this notion of cannot occur in his, uh, and this, so this is a co-exclusion. It says, if I saw this state, later I saw this state. So this is a sense of time-like in the sense there's a change, but it's abstract time. It's not actual time-time. It's not relativistic time. It's not, there's no seconds to it. It just says a change occurred. So these two, these two pieces here are actually more primitive than space-time. And in fact, if you don't have these as a primitive, you can't simulate this with anything else. So this is fundamental. And if you guys don't understand that, then I haven't spent, done a good enough job or spending enough time talking about it. So if somebody else wants to follow up with me on this, this is really important. And so this built-in concurrent 
transparency and change, there's no light cone yet at all. So it's all in space light comp computation environment. And by the way, entanglement is space light. The same thing is if you don't have a space light primitive in your representation, you can't simulate entanglement unless you have a space like operator. So entanglement is part of this primitive nature and we'll see where that comes from too. So just realize these are fundamental because you can't simulate these in any other kind of system. They have to be fundamental. So I've, you've seen the coin demo here. I'm gonna just show that briefly here for the purposes of looking at this, but basically how many coins do I have? Well, if you show them both simultaneously, truly simultaneously, and that is resolved, and where did the information come from the, from the presence of the two coins? So this is the co-occurrence again. And this is, he calls this non-Shannon space-like information derived from true simultaneity. I believe if you took two dimensions and you said in the Big Bang, all of a sudden we said two dimensions are all of a sudden coming together. This has an effective energy of this co-occurrence of these two dimensions coming together and it forms a qubit. Well, that bit represents an effective energy by Landauer's principle. So you can say, well, that bit the bits coming together in dimensions coalescing into these qubits and e-bits and, and two and three combination pairs of these is, is how the Big Bang occurred. And I call it a bit bang. It's how you can create matter, energy, space, and time from nothing. And the nothing is just bits. So you don't have to figure out, oh, and even space and time emerges from this. So this is a big idea here. And, but so far nobody's, talking to me about this. And so I'd like someone to think that this is really important as like Mike and I felt that way. So what is the geometric algebra then? Essentially you have G0 through G5, four through five, you have different sizes, just like Hilbert spaces of different sizes. And the difference is, is that you have a single, a single vector A, or you have A and B, these are orthogonal, A, B, and C. And then, but the thing you have key is, is you have these, what are we call spinners. So if you have dimension A and B and you take the outer product of them, all you can do since they're orthogonal is create a new thing called a bivector, which is uh, this planar view. It's, it's actually a two-dimensional two object. And I represent it like this. And that has an orientation in and out of the page. And this is a spinner. By the way, Hilbert space doesn't have this concept. They have something they call I, but that's slightly different because here this is primitive. It's saying how you can create, in fact, here's how you can create I. If you take a spinner and you, and you, it's equal to its inverse, it's anti-commutative. So if you take the square of it and you insert it in here and you solve it, you find out that any vector is the square root of minus one. It's a, it's a, it's a, so you can even bootstrap, not only can you bootstrap bivectors, vectors, which Hilbert space doesn't have, you can bootstrap spinners, the imaginary numbers from this, and that's why you can represent a qubit in here, even though you have just pure bits as the primitives. So you have a geometric product, which is equivalent to the tensor product. But the difference is here is that in, in tensor product, all you create is more vectors. So you have no structure to the space except for more dimensions. But geometric algebra actually has these topological things called bivectors and trivectors and n vectors. And those things are the basis for not only Topsy, but it's also, we believe, the basis for the structure of the standard model. Without these things, it's just a high dimensional space, but it doesn't have any structure to it. It has states, but it doesn't have any structure to the state. So, um, and this, this implies if you see A minus B, and then later you say minus A plus B, then you know that at I equals zero, that means there implies AB. So if you see any states like this, and you see these states have changed, it implies operators to have them got there. So this that's how co-occurrence and co-exclusion are defined. And so you can take a truth table and you can turn this into like, um, and I'm gonna show this in the next slide here, so I'll just go to that. So here's, here's my geometric algebra tool, it's in Python. Anybody can download this. I can give them the link or it's in the last talk I gave. Um, and uh, if you have A plus B, A is bound, is in Python, is a variable bound to a vector A. So it prints itself as a vector. So it's a, it's a redevelop print loop that prints itself represent, self printing and self, and we use operator overload for um, plus and the, and the um, so if I take B outer product A, puts it in standard normal form and it takes, oh, the standard normal form of B outer product A is this bivector called A, outer product B that's inverted. And likewise, we can take tri-vectors, the same thing, 
and you can create the smallest vector state for any time you have a plus b plus c, you by definition you have all these bi vectors and tri vectors as well. And if you were to look at the the the, the what this means in a truth table, it looks like the state zero 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 plus. So that means this this looks like a truth table. And I'll show you in a minute what that looks like. But then we can represent qubits and a spinner object and take and change it so that we can get the square root of a spinner and we can take superposition and we can get quantum registers where the quantum register, instead of using a tensor product, we use the geometric product to get the state. This looks exactly like the Hilbert space representation for a qubit, but it's in geometric algebra. Okay, and then here's the truth table. If you take something like this, you can put it in this app, this uh, function we call GA states. And what it does is it creates, it iterates through all the combinations of A and B with plus and minuses. And then what it does is it shows you what the output of this expression using this, this algebra, this essentially addition and multiplication rules, okay? And I did all this stuff, by the way, in my PhD, which I graduated in 2002 with that. But you can also go in and say, um, you can also look at what those bits are and we can, and we can look at what the bit rate is. But essentially, if there's these bits, you can say, out of all the possible combinations of A and B, how often does this state occur? And we, and, and we can assign a bit value to that. And that's where we can show that the, the, that the coin demo comes out, the coin demo comes out of qubits in geometric algebra. So we can actually show that. So what are these? Again, here's the one dimensional bit. There's three orientations. We think of them as truly as vectors. And if you have the same bit A and minus A at the same time and you add them together, you get zero. And that means that those two states are mutually exclusive and they can't occur simultaneously. That's what the zero means, cannot occur. And these, I call these bit vectors, but they're also proto dimensions and they're also distinctions. So they're also kind of like uh, laws of forms kind of um, distinctions as well. So when you have two of these, now you have two orthogonal dimensions and this looks like a qubit. And, um, and but this, this looks just like a qubit. This is, this is a bra ket notation and this is an orthogonal ket zero and it's a ket one. These are equivalent to state zero and state one. And if you represent that graphically, it looks like that. And by the way, when you do the analysis on this, you get actually qubits, but you actually see unitary expressions in this algebra. You can go through all the expressions in the algebra. You can find things that where the square is one or the square is zero, nilpotent and um, idempotent um, and and and, and uh, identitary. Ident I, I, I'm getting the name wrong here but neutrinos are where their square is one. Okay, I'll talk about that in a minute. So once you have three of these, then you call get tri vectors. And by the way, if you have a three dimensional space, then you can take the, in, you can product, multiply A to plus B times plus C times ABC, and you get this thing, which is the quaternions. And this has, we showed all of this in the previous things, and you get quarks. And this is what Mike showed 10 years ago when he says, Doug, help me says photons, we can get photons, we can get gluons, we can get quarks, we can get mesons, electrons, and neutrinos, and, um, and you get pro protons and ne neutrons as well in there. So this, you could completely identify every state in a three-dimensional space, and guess what? There's no room for ebits in there. The only way you can get an ebit is if you take two qubits, so now you have a four-dimensional space, you can get, you can find this Bell operator, which is just the spinner of these two, and you can apply these operators to the uh, quantum register state, all using geometric algebra, and you can get this state, which is the Bell state and the magic state. And these states are all entangled, okay? And what we find out is those states are entangled because um, it's using multiplicative cancellation in geometric algebra. So, um, so you, you can show how you can use entangled states if you take the bell operator and you multiply it times a quantum register in states a0 and a, a b0 you end up with these states the spinner of 00, zero spinner of 0, zero 01 uh, one, one, and that's just these are the actual bell states they're exactly equivalent to the bell states in geometric algebra and they have exactly the same properties of them and what you find out is this state here is actually like a qubit in a higher dimensional space and you just like you can use a single single 
single operator for uh, the spinner to rotate through all the states for, an e, for a qubit by having a SA plus SAB, you can apply this bell operator over and over and over again. And it looks like a phase angle in this higher dimensional space. And those are all of the quantums, quantum space. So an E bit is actually an e, a qubit in a higher dimensional space. And it requires you a four dimensional space to support the differentiation of that and to support the multiplicative cancellation. So the thing is, you and why is this that you know this is true? Because you can't factor this. This is inseparable, what's called inseparable. And these bad bell and magic operators are irreversible. And I've proved that in my dissertation two ways. Um, it's irreversible in G4, and that's completely different than we see it, see it in Hilbert space. So I would like somebody to help me figure out, well, well, how important is that? I believe it's very important. See the proof that this does not exist, and I did this exhaustively by searching all 43 million states and ran over a month to run this proof exhaustively. And then I did it closed form, too. And that's all in my dissertation. So, so if you can look at every possible state, corner state in the space, and you say, well, there's no possible... There's no possible operator that is equivalent to this, then this is irreversible. And again, we proved that. So, and the reason why this works is because if you have a qubit, you have state A0 and A0, A, B, and B0. These are the two notations I use for qubits, capital A, which stands for qubit A, capital B for B, qubit B. If you multiply those together, implied multiplication here, then you get this state, which is the same as the, but, but if you look at the underline, this state here is B3, and this state here is M3. So a qubit state actually has bell and magic states concurrently together. If you multiply any qubit state that has this representation times either the bell or magic operator, then the conjugate of it cancels out due to multiplicative cance cancellation. So if you multiply this, one of these pairs disappear, and that's erasure of information. Landauer's principle says, this is irreversible. So again, multiplicative cancellation, irreversibility, it means that it's irreversible by three different arguments here. This is an important argument. Someone in AMPA should realize how important this is and help get the word out about this. And, uh, and I don't know if that's possible with this group, but I would encourage somebody to talk to me about this. This is one of the big things that Mike and I figured out during my dissertation, and then we figured out additional things. Mike figured out that there's a thing called a Talquernian. Just like an EBIT is a higher dimensional version of a qubit, he, Mike came up with this term called Talquernians, and he called them T sub i, J sub i, and K sub i, and they're equivalent to Quaternions, i, j, and k. Um, it's a higher dimensional version of that, right? And so, instead of having a single bivector here, it's the sum of bivectors, right? And these states here act like a higher dimensional version of a quaternion, so they're a tau quaternion, it's a quaternium isomorph. And you can say, you can take the conjugate of those, and those also exist, and they're anti-commutative. You can take any one of those, you can prove this easily, and you can sum all these together, and you get one plus ABC, and you go, well, what is that, Doug? Well, it turns out it's equivalent to a sparse version of minus one. So, it, and that squared is equal to plus one, a sparse version of plus one, okay? And if you take a look at this report I have, it says, what are the states of this one minus A, B, C, D, which is a, a four vector that is all the, is the, um, is a combination of all the states of all the vectors in a four dimensional space, then you see that this is, this is a sparse version of, zero, of, of minus one. See the minuses there? And the other versions are zero, so which means they do not exist. And likewise, if you take this one, minus one, minus A, B, C, D, you get the plus version of it. So both, all of these things show that it's equivalent to a quaternion with this caveat that it's embedded in a higher dimensional space, okay? And you can show that this is exactly equivalent to um, quaternions and that here's all the bell and magic states for this. So, um, so one of the things that Mike realized was if you take all of these tocordians and you sum them together, you find that there are cases where h squared is equal to zero, which means it's a boson, okay? And he believes that there are all these char characterizations here of this 
And, but by the way, you can take this, this is by the way, just the complete even subalgebra of G4. That's all it is. And you'd think that would be a special thing. Well, it is, we think it's the Higgs boson. And so, um, so it, it forms, you can factor that because it's just the even subalgebra and you can factor that out and you get this. And so you could, since, by, since all factorizations are valid for geometric algebra, because you don't know which factorization it's using, it looks like time-like thing with space. This, this here we think is a quaternion. It's also nilpotent. AB plus AC plus BC is nilpotent. Its square is zero, which means it's, it's, like, it's like a photon. So I think space itself is like a photon. In fact, this is a rotation of a photon. If you take A plus B plus C, which we think is the photon, it's nilpotent, it squares that. If you multiply A plus B plus C times ABC, you get this. So if something is a factor, something is a factor is nilpotent, then this is also nilpotent. Also, you can convert it to this, light and space. So here you have space again, plus light. So here's, here's light. So you can, again, Mike was really good at finding these various factorizations. And what you can find that there's 16 permutations of this here, that where x squared is equal to zero, and then you have a bunch of them where, um, where where this is true x, where this is, where you can wrote this is a particular state where 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 you um, where it's anti-commutative, you can put it in an either order, and you get the back, the result back. Okay, um, and and then there's another 48 states where this is where the square is equal to plus or minus a b c d, and we think and he thinks this is the Higgs and this is kind of like a mass-like primitive, because its square is a b c d, and it has this property here. So, so these again important concepts because it's complete even. He calls this a proto mass. This is what Mike called this. Okay. So what does this mean? So here's the normal standard model. Okay. And this normal standard model is they just put it in a matrix like this, okay, square matrix. And then all of a sudden they put the Higgs on the side like this. Well, we think it should be organized like this. In G1, there's only nine states, it's a bit. It's, it's just the bit and an integer, that's it. So, and then in G2, there's 81 states. Well, you can see that there are neutrinos in here. And, um, um, and we think that there is a new neutrino we call the X neutrino. And I'll talk about that in a minute, but there's also two bosons. So we think the Z and W bosons are actually two dimensional. And we think the neutrinos are two dimensional. And we believe that there's a fourth one because if you look at this, all the permutations in this space, you find out that there's a fourth state. And you go, and one of the other talks I've given, I said, if you take this neutrino, what is it? Well, if you take the sum for every neutrino, there's an antineutrino. So if you were to take the sum of the three antineutrinos and sum them up, you would get this neutrino. So even if we could create an experiment to produce this device, it would be very hard because you would have to sum the three antineutrinos to get this neutrino. Probably doesn't occur very easily in nature. So, um, or even if they did, neutrinos are so hard to measure, you couldn't ever see it. So that's what's that's what we believe that there's a prediction here that there's a thing. Also, we believe that there's here's the quarks. There are three. You have to have three dimensions to be quarks. You can't have quarks in two dimensions. There's not enough room in the space for it. So you find the gluons and you find this photon, but you also find what we thought maybe this is the quaternion. This is like the X um, X boson that they're talking about. It's a low energy boson. It's a it's essentially a rotation of the photon. You know, and 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 so this how how space and light are tied together. Okay, and and there's electrons, but we find that there's twice as many electrons as we have because for every one of these electron states, there's the anti there's the um, anti electrons versions of these two, the anti particle versions of these. Well, we see twelve instead of six, and so what we're seeing is the char ch a chirality version of these electrons in here too. But then when you do that, all of the states are completely comprehended in three dimensions. So once you get to four dimensions, now we, we think that there's, um, the Higgs boson is in the four dimensional space and there's about 17 other particles and 33, 30 other bosons in this state. And we haven't explored completely what all that was. So, so and that's because if you have unitary and nilpotent 
and um, things like that. We believe that those are how you find particles in these spaces, okay? Um, so, so here's a, about how you bootstrap the universe. You start with space. It just starts with one dimensional bits, okay? And that's equivalent. And as you increase complexity, now two of those, two, two of those co-occur. Co, co so now you have qubits. So if you did that, you can look at the distribution of a two-bit space and you find that there's a probability that there's going to be qubits in there, probability there's going to be neutrinos in there, probability there's going to be W and Z, just because this space has those probabilities in there. So once you have a two, that's equivalent to 2.17 bits by just looking at all the permutations of that space and saying how often they occur for qubits. So then finally you get to a three-dimensional space and all of a sudden photons and mesons and all this other stuff starts appearing, quaternions. And so now you actually have space. Um, and then you have talquernions. And so you can bootstrap the universe completely from bits by just co-occurring more and more bits into qubit, into bivectors and trivectors and quad vectors and like this. And so you can bootstrap the universe from nothing. You don't have to have space. You don't have to have time. You don't have to have matter. You don't have to have energy. All you have to have bits and co-occurrence and that's it, period. And you can bootstrap the universe, okay? And then you can also do Tarquinians where you can get space-time emerges probably in G5. Um, and then there's also geometric, there's also our version of, of neural networks that I called correlithms. And essentially you can, this is a high dimensional neural network space. This is the space that Hawkins is using in his company, in the, in the, in the neural computing company that he's doing. And he basically has gone on record and says, if you're not using Kenerva style memories, which is, this is a generalization of Kenerva style memories. It just doesn't use phase angles. It uses distance metric as a, as a distance metric. If you're not using this, you're not doing AI. And the reason is because there's mathematical properties of this space that don't exist in lower dimensional spaces. So if you look, if you get sidetracked by Hawking's, oh, he's a neural computing guy. No, there's this math behind the neural computing that he's doing that is more fundamental than any neural model you're doing, which is the same problem I had with, um, with Mike's work too, is he was so focused in on the neural computing. I don't believe the, the brain is a neural computer. I believe the mind is a, is a mathematical hyperspace mind, quantum mind, and that the brain is just a three-dimensional antenna that converts a hyperdimensional space into a three-dimensional space. So Mike and I completely disagreed about that. And so I never worked on Topsy, partly because I wasn't, his early version of it stopped working one time, somebody broke it. And so then I suggested to Mike 10 years ago that he um, do it in Erlang because Erlang has the massive parallelism that you need to support what he's trying to do. So I think then that's why um, Erlang work was done by er Ulrich, okay? so so. So here, what, what, what was the result of what we did? We had this hyperdimensional bit vectors and n vectors. Again, n vectors don't exist in, in Hilbert space. And so bit vectors are protophysical and they're orthogonal. This is what we say. And, and, and you can't have them inside three dimensions. They are a soup of hyperdimensional space and our three dimensional space is runs like a simulation inside them. So it's bigger than the physical universe and it's outside the physical universe. So it's an infinite supply of those bit vectors since they're mathematical. And there are hyperdimensional bit vectors creates these n vectors and hierarchy as they're combined. Bi vectors are equivalent to imaginary numbers and n vectors are fundamental and are missing from Hilbert spaces, okay? So we get the geometric product and anti-commutative vectors are built in, okay? And multiplicative cancellation in G is geometric algebra is fundamental to entanglement. And um, multi-vectors are just sums of these vectors, bivectors, trivectors, like that. So I call it a bivector. And the other thing is in, G in Hilbert space, the vectors and the operators are completely different orthogonal representations. One is a, is a matrix and the other one is a state, is, is a vector space. And is the, 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 the ket is just a, ve is just a vector space, right? Um, a very specific vector space, but it's still a vector space. But the operators are always matrices, okay? Well, in this geometric algebra, every state is both a vector, is both an operator and a state. So I call this, it's a verb noun balance. So you can take any state in geometric algebra and treat it like a state or an operator. Okay, this is a fundamental difference because now you have a system that's closed and the operators in the system are part of the system itself. And 
So, you know, this is an important thing. Um, and I talk about this in my book. So if you go to Deep Reality Book, I spend, I mean, all this stuff is in my book. So if you haven't gotten my book, please, please go and buy it. Um, because it talks about all this stuff in a very precise way that I can't do in 20, in 30, 40 minutes. Okay. So, um, so eventually you have a hyperdimensional VIT vectors and change for C normal space. So this is the space light operators that has to be built in. You can't simulate space light in something that doesn't have space light to begin with. And co-exclusion, you can't have change. It has to be built in so that you can have these operators. So space like simultaneity of bit vectors is built in in fundamentals. So, so obviously, since it's outside of space and time, it has infinite computational concurrency. So if you're trying to simulate the physical universe, right, and you're trying to simulate all the concurrency that's in the physical universe, you need something that has an infinite supply of concurrency to do that with. And that's what this infinite dimensional space is. It has an infinite amount of computational concurrency since there are no space-time metrics yet. It's not in space-time. And so this is the essence of how you simulate the physical, classical universe and even the quantum universe on top of this bit, bit physics, proto-physics, bit physics infrastructure that's informational, not energy. You only have energy once you have space and time. All you have is topology and consistency at this point. And consistency is the and 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 consistency is the precursor to energy loss. So um, so anyhow, and then the coin demo is part of that philosophy. So again, the coin demo is like the tip of the iceberg here, um, but it's all built on these concepts. And if you and if you kind of like don't realize how deep it is, this is a deep set of concepts here. And this group should be the ones who care about this stuff, okay? So, so, so let's talk about this hyperdimensional complexity. So you have n vectors, multi vectors, they emerge from bit vectors in GN. And you have imaginary numbers, e qubits and ebits and quantum operators because they're all there. Quaternions, Tocornians, Tocquinians, all are multi vectors that have these properties that they create space. You can simulate space using quaternions and Tocornians. So you can, you can bootstrap space using that. G3 is a Equivalent, this is Mike has always said this GS3 is equivalent to poly algebra, and G4 contains G Dirac algebra. And the multiplicative cancellation is important. Idempotency, unitary, and nilpotence is how we explore the space to find out what's in it. Particles are unitary, and bosons are nilpotent. And the standard model has Higgs boson and dark matter energy forms. We think that there's a quark. A quark looks like X plus, I mean, A plus BC, right? Well, what if you have A plus B, C, D? It's like a quark-like thing. It's odd algebra, completely odd algebra. We think that's equivalent to a dark quark, okay? And that dark quark is used to build dark matter, okay? And so we also did a Majorana model. I've talked about this in other places about it. But, but one of the things you realize is the idempotent unitary thing. See this down here? If you have X squared is equal to X, that's idempotent. And if you have u squared is equal to one is unitary, then we can show that x for all cases, x is equal to minus one plus u, substituting it in, squaring it, and you get x squared is equal to x. So for every unitary item, you have an idempotent thing as well. And this is the basis for um, weight and single emerge from this idempotent unitary hierarchy. This is, this, this is the basis for all concurrency using weight and signal. And this is a common computer science thing. And it emerges naturally from this. And this is what Topsy is really doing. And that's why we can use Erlang to simulate this because it's using, it's simulating weight and signal, signal. It's simulating the weight and signal stuff in the, in the Topsy system using the weight and signal stuff that's in um, the tuple space. So, so that's, and by the way, when you do all this, if you have weight and signal that's built in, it's, it's an emer it's, it emerges from idempotent and unitary. Essentially, the operating system is built into this, into the system, into the um, high dimensional space. The operating system is built in. You don't have to build an operating system on top of it. So this isn't, that's why I like the idea of Topsy. I'm not interested in working in it, um, but, but this is important why it's important, okay? So- Can you round up within five minutes, please? Okay, I'm almost done here. Okay. So here's here's my statement. Geometric algebra, 
bit physics is protophysics. Coin demo creates energy in the bit bang. Neutrinos are two dimensional. There's four variations of neutrinos. Electrons have two X chirality variations. Entanglement operators in Bell are irre irreversible in geometric algebra. Entanglement is connected to the space like operator. Higgs boson is entangled using Tocorians. Proposed dark matter, dark energy, and dark matter are entangled in four dimension odd algebras. And we don't see them because they're odd algebra and most other matter is even algebra. Complexity and hierarchy is emergent due to graded n vectors. And here's um, what I pre pre ask for the, this is the last slide, proposed source science research. Protophysics themes, explore fundamental bit vectors and n vectors, explore foundations of built-in space-like concurrency and change, research how space and time emerges from bit vectors, might, might be G5, explore if neutrinos really are two dimensions, can, two dimensional, can we create an experiment to do that? Explore if there really are four dimensions, four neutrinos and neutrino pairs. Um, show that photons and quaternions are related to X boson maybe. Um, confirm entanglement is irreversible. I don't know how we would do that, um, but people think that entanglement is not, but I believe entanglement is irreversible. And the Higgs boson is a 4D even algebra structure and the dark quarks matter and energy are 4D odd algebra structure and the topsy development of research. Now I'm interested in metaphysical themes, which is why I'm doing all this. We could show that using a Kiskit tool, IBM's Kiskit tool, we could create qubits versus intention experiments, excuse me. Um, and we could do EBITs versus an attention experiments. And also I gave a talk about our new wish technology company that I'm working with, and it generates coherence. And we believe what this space is, this wish is doing, it's actually creating higher dimensional versions of entanglement in a space, which ends up being creating, raising the grade of the space from three dimensional to four and five dimensional. And we've seen significant results on this if you go to um, coherent spaces.life.life, um, the wish it, research that we're doing, and look at the uh, testimonials. We're having a big effect on, on autistic kids because now all of a sudden we're making their brain interact with their mind better, and their mind is a higher dimensional object. Um, and so they just don't interact with their brain very well. So this device helps create a bridge to that. You can't have a model for that at all if you're using electromagnetics. So it's a quantum resonance device that's creating a higher dimensional space. Mm -hmm bridge. So, um, so here's my challenge for you guys. Um, get involved, figure out how to work with this stuff. Um, um, GAL is different. So people don't invest learning on it. General science is ignored geometric algebra. I mean, if we have to write papers of this and that's it, this is my last talk slide. And so if you guys want to get involved, contact, you know, Ehrlich or me and, um, get involved with this. This is fundamental stuff. So it's right in what geomet you know, AMPA people care about. So, and here's the last slide we're showing. The last time I visited Mike in 2007. Okay, thank you. Doug. Any questions? And, uh, are there any questions from Zoom? We are just getting getting here. Do we have any questions? Oh yes, Nicola, please. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, well, thank you very much, Doug. Um, and I, as you know, I did actually, well, I think you know, I did actually buy your book. Um, oh, good. After the last time that, that, that you spoke. But as you also know, I'm involved in lots and lots of things. Yeah. And, uh, so I haven't, you know, so I started looking, oh, okay, but do you mind, right? But so this has been very, very, help, very interesting, very helpful. I mean, just but I mean, there's, I mean, there's just so, so many questions that I could put. Well, yeah. I would like you to obviously send me a link to this talk, and you know, it will be coming on. on a, a yeah, on the Zoom talk. Well, yeah. You know, yeah. um, but I mean, there was just like there was some so there were some really weird things that you said that I was kind of interested in. Um, at the base. Well, it's all Mike's and my work for the last 20 yeah. years. Yeah, yeah. No, okay. I mean, so Mike, Mike had a lot of overlap with all of these concepts. And I want to tell you, this is part of Mike's legacy. Is yeah. not just Topsy, but all of this work because, you know, I thought he was working on Topsy exclusively. And then all of a sudden he says, hey, Doug, here's the standard model back 10 years ago. And I'm going, yay, Mike. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I think, you know, you and, and Ulrich have both really been really, really helpful in presenting, you know, you know, what Mike was doing and how it's possible to go on from there. 
Um, yeah. Which is really important. But I, I just, there are a couple of like, like really sort of basic things that, yeah. that, that you said that I think. So there was this thing you said like erasure is irreversible. Yeah. Right. And this is, I mean, like. Multiplicative cancellation is causes erasure, which is, yeah. which is irreversible. Yeah. So, th I mean, Mike Horner and I are interested in the Akashic records. Oh, yeah. Um, so, <laughs> which I think you probably are as well. Yeah, um, I mean, yeah. The, if you have a hyperdimensional space, it's big enough that you never have to erase anything. That's quantum computing fundamentals 101. But if you're using in a closed space, you can have a closed system that has erasure in it. Okay, so gotcha. there, there you go. So quantum computing, irreversible quantum computing shows that you can com compute anything without ever, and have it be reversible, which means you're not erasing anything. Land hours yeah. principle. But Akashic <laughs> Records yeah. allows you to have all that information without erasures. So. Um, yeah, no, 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 that's nice. And um, as it came up again, something, it was to do with entanglement. And entanglement, yeah, being irreversible. Yeah, it is in geometric algebra. So, yeah. I mean, yeah. I would like someone in AMPA who has, who would want to write a paper about that and then get it published because nobody knows about this. Yeah. You know, and you, there's some physicists involved in here and they would go, yeah, what does this mean? And can we, and can we write a paper and propose an experiment on this? You know, somebody who can get it published in some, other than my website you know for help uh, yeah no, that's a great Tampa group and not for me for the mike legacy story <laughs> well i think it's a great project i don't think i'm the one to be able to do it but i think it's yeah it's beautiful so thank you thank someone you. someone in the ampa probably cares <laughs> thank you Thanks for your questions and your comments. Little things that Mike was touching. And the and that's the on the back, guys. Okay, go ahead. Uh, they, they are, I think they are washed out. <laughs> would, it, would you like to say something? Um, I would like to say thank you, Doc. Uh, <laughs> basically, because I'm. Um, my issue is, of course, that I don't have all the involvement in that part about the mathematics and things as you had with Mike. Uh, yeah. so I'm more like a practical guy just trying to do stuff. Uh, yeah. So that's what I will try to do. That's I will try and build something and see if it works or not. And then I hope that we can help each other over time with all the probably needed adjustments. Uh, yeah. That's where I'm starting. Yeah, I mean, I'm very practical too, Earl. Okay. I, I can I'm see here. Michael Horner had, had a question. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I think no, he, I think no, he was no, just saying was... yes to you. Ah, yeah, yes to you. Yeah. Saying. Okay. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. By so, the way, nice talk you gave. I I appreciate because I learned some things too from about Mike. So. Yeah. No. Thank you. It's great. I I want um also you and Aldrich to send me your papers, and I look forward to getting the recordings because I have a son who's a computer coder and a musician. So I think he's the one that I need to say, look, there was this guy, Mike Manthe, which is, who's still around somewhere. So we- Yeah, he's here. <laughs> <laughs> Tune in. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Okay, yeah. I think if there is no more questions, uh, we we say again, thank you. Thank you, Doug. And yes. finish for today. Thank yeah, you. and you guys, you guys have a good rest of the tr um, weekend, okay, or week. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, unless there's more, any more questions, I'm going to leave, so.